Life is supernatural. And the only way to administer life is to have supernatural support and reinforcement. Opportunities for you to waste your life will come. And, and, and some of them come in form of preaching on opportunities. The more it starts becoming clear, you begin to see opportunities will be coming with intensity. But you can judge because God has begun to fine-tune you. How many of you have used a camera before and you are fine-tuning the lens so that the image becomes clearer? That's how God works on you. The more you work with him, the more fine-tuned you become. You will know what is in your lane and what is outside of your lane. The more you work with him, a lot of pastors want to be your friends, and there's nothing wrong with that. But as you become more precise, you will know that this kind of friendship will not, your values are different, your orientation is different, the direction you are going is different, and you want to become friends. To say something before I jump back into the script. Um, God's vision for you is bigger than your, the personal ambition you have for yourself now. God's vision, please help me preach to your neighbor God's vision for you, is greater than your personal ambition that you have for yourself. For your information, I never thought that I will be an international preacher and I did not pray for it. I did not desire it. What I wanted to be was someone that could handle the word of God with integrity and raise people that Jesus can trust. That was my objective. That was the, the reason why I was behind the pulpit. Hallelujah. In fact, we went to Abuja uh, after my elder brother's wedding and then a preacher came and snatched me from the wedding and said, we need to go and counsel with one of our brethren. I was confused. He said, you, you know the Bible. If we go there, open scriptures and counsel the person. So I did not even have the details of this counseling. But the first me, we went. When we went there, we were waiting for the person that we came to counsel in his sitting room. So when he woke up, we waited for like 20 minutes. I said, someone that needs counseling should be waiting for us. We should not be the ones waiting for somebody that we are coming to give counsel. So when the person came out of a, a preacher, he came out of the room and he saw us, he began to speak in tongues. I was confused because we came to counsel. Now uh, there's a prayer meeting. Okay. Then he shouted. Then he came to me and said, Don't say the Lord. <laughs> I, I, was, I was asking myself, why, why are we here now? <laughs> that you have an international ministry. I just lock, I lock my heart because God has never told me that I had an international ministry. So I was hearing him. So I said, You're planting uh, branches of your ministry in Europe. I was satisfied being a pastor in my God. And I was not excited at the prophecy because God has not told me that I had an international mission. Are you, do you understand what I'm talking about? He finished prophesying and saying so many things. When he finished the prophecy, and I told the person that brought me, let's, let's, go, wait, let's go. Because it's obvious, no counsel. You are coming to counsel somebody, he has prophesied on you. So how do you, engage? <laughs> how do you now sit him down and say, I, I said, well done, God bless. That's how we left that place. It took another four years before I knew that I had international ministry. It was after God now spoke to me that I had international ministry. I was now trying to remember what the brother said. Hey, Europe, hey. Do you know that those things have happened? The day we flew to Belgium to set up our branch, that, that day, anointing that day was something else. So, you know, can you imagine that a minister that starts from Akkadi goes around the world? Not from Abuja, not from Lagos, not from Buttercourt, starting from where? Doesn't make sense. But it's, that's why God needs to 
He needs to align your life. So part of what he will do as he begins to labor over your spirit is that he begins to bring you into precision. Now, are you there? Now, I have so many invitations where to preach. But 70% of the invitations, I'm not attending to them. You know why? Because I know what God wants me to do. And those invitations don't fall into the category of things that God wants me to do. Do you understand that? And this is not pride. This is not pride. Don't waste your life on things that are not directly connected to your eternal purpose. Invitations everywhere. In fact, my rule now is that if a number calls me that is not registered on my phone, it's blocked. I don't need new friends. I don't need new invitations. I don't need to visit new places. The ones God has shown me, if I can achieve it with my lifetime, <laughs> that is where I'm going. You become more focused. Opportunities for you to waste your life will come. And, and, and some of them come in form of preaching on opportunities. The more it starts becoming clear, you begin to see opportunities will be coming with intensity. But you can judge because God has begun to fine-tune you. How many of you have used the camera before and you are fine-tuning the lens so that the image becomes clearer? That's how God works on you. The more you work with him, the more fine-tuned you become, you will know what is in your lane and what is outside of your lane. The more you work with him, a lot of pastors want to be your friends and there's nothing wrong with that. But as you become more precise, you will know that this kind of friendship will not, your values are different, your orientation is different, the direction you are going is different and you want to become friends. Is that not, there's something wrong with that. You'll be able to judge the kind of people that you can relate with on the path towards the achieving of that destiny. God doesn't want you to, to expand your strength. So he begins to streamline you and he streams line, stream lines you like, like an arrow that is poised at hitting the target. Is that clear? And that's not pride. It's not pride at all. It's just that you have come to a, a better understanding of your lane. There was a time where any invitation that came, I would preach. Then another time now came, he now began to define it. And I now discovered that it's not every invitation that falls into the category of what God has approved. Now, it's even slimmer. There is a trademark that any minister I relate with must have. And um, it happens to be that people that have that trademark are few. So God has put me in the unpopular lane. Are you there? Smith Wiggles, what? Was it the one? Or oh, Lester Sumra? He said at the age of, if you are 40 years in ministry, if you are 60 years of age and you have three good friends, then you are lucky. Uh, I'll leave you with that. I know it doesn't make sense to some of you now because you are still on the Broadway. As God begins to streamline you, you will find out that some people you call your friends are the ones that expose you the most. Part of the prayers we are going to pray during the course of this fasting is that the Lord should open our eyes to see the people around us then you might find out that you are in a canoe that is about to sink. So God begins to align you. He begins to, you know, point you at purpose so that you can expend your resources uh, to achieve God's will. So that's the bond offering. Abraham responded to the advances of God by raising an altar of complete committal to God. And that is what we call consecration in the New Testament. God is interested about the shape of the person that offers sacrifice to him. It must be someone that is consecrated to serve his will because that is what is going to give God a soft spot concerning you. The reason why I'm living is because I'm living to serve him. Uh, it must come from someone that is separated unto him. The meaning of the person's life is the meaning that God confers upon him. It's not the meaning that he wants to get in view of the perception of the world system or the age in which he finds himself, but his meaning derives from what God says he was called to achieve. The Bible says in him, all things 
consist. It means that I'm going to receive a definition of my essence from Jesus Christ. And Jesus, in dealing with me so far, has made me to understand that one of the major highlights of the service he has called me to bring to the body of Christ is to build capacity using the instrument of the infallible Word of God. So most of my labors are in the Word of God. If you say, are you a prayer person? I would say yes. But I'm more of a Bible man than a prayer man. That's my orientation. My wife is more of a prayer woman than she's a Bible woman. In fact, when it's time for her to preach, she'll wake me up and say, my husband, let's study this thing together. I'm in the Bible. And don't get it wrong. You might think that that means I don't pray. You are wrong. You are so wrong. I can pray for 18 hours with my back on my bed. So don't, don't I know your mind is saying, okay. Oh, okay. It means I'm like you. You are not like me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not like you. If you know the things that come at me in the realm of the spirit, sometimes you'll be in prayers for three days. In those days, I don't study the Bible. I study the Bible when there's peace. When there's a war in the spirit, for, you can see me for seven days, I'm speaking in tongues. But when we finish with that war, then I come back. But my wife, prayer comes to her naturally. The one she's learning is Bible study. Me, Bible study came to me naturally. The one I learn is prayer. Find out the hand that God gave you. You have one hand. Is it prayer? Then discipline yourself to study the Bible. If, like me, Bible study comes easily to you, there's something that draws you to the Bible, then go and look for the other hand because you cannot clap with one hand. Exactly. One will come to you naturally. Glory to God. Find the one that does not come naturally and develop it because you must fly on both wings. Okay, so let's move. The next is what we call the next offering that God commanded in the Old Testament, which is very significant, is what we call the peace offering. And the peace offering is significant because it is through the manifestation of this peace offering that God reveals our level of compliance in spiritual matters. Come with me. Now, peace has a wide spectrum of meanings in New Testament Christianity. So I want to show you two sides of the pole. We have the God of peace and we have the peace of God. Two sides of the pole. Uh, I think Isaiah chapter 53 Verse 5 will be a worthy introduction into this subject. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. There was a sacrifice that was released to secure peace. You know, I told you that our priesthood is based on Jesus' priesthood. Everything we are doing in our priestly business is based on the foundation that our high priest has created. Are you there? I say, are you there? And that's why when you go into uh, the holy place, you will find some piece of furniture. And I told you that the brazen altar is referring to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That is what even legitimizes our priesthood. Without that sacrifice, you don't even have a basis of saying you want to commune with God, you want to do business with God, you are hoping that God will give you a personal covenant. All of that is available to us because Jesus uh, paid the ultimate price and the greatest altar that is in the earth is the brazen altar, which is the cross of Jesus Christ. And I need to show you the implications, the judicial implication of the cross of Jesus uh, is a type of peace that is enshrined in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 1. Romans, chapter 5, verse 1. It reveals um, a type of peace that results from the, the satisfaction of divine justice. The Bible says, therefore, being justified by faith. I hope you know what justification means. It means to be declared righteous. The kind of thing that happens in the court 
when the judge, having heard both sides of the argument and comparing and compromising the arguments with the spirit of the law, comes forth with a judgment. The judgment is, is the fruit, is the result um, of unveiling the true perspective of justice, judgment, and equity. So the Bible says, therefore, being justified by faith. When the blood of Jesus was brought into the court of law and my sin was put on the beam balance and the blood of Jesus was put on this other side of the beam balance, the weight of the blood of Jesus superseded the weight of my sin. So justice was pronounced in my life on the strength of the weight of the blood of Jesus. So the judge, who happens to be a righteous judge, now declares me righteous. Because of my faith in Jesus Christ, his blood makes the judgment that was hanging on my head inconsequential. Because his blood is a proof that that judgment has already been served, and he was the one that took away that judgment so that I can experience the initial blessing among many other blessings that will come. That initial blessing is justification. I was declared what? Righteous. That legal statement that came from the judge is what was responsible to end my quarrel with God. So being justified by faith, the Bible says we have peace with God. That's the first line of peace. That's the one I wanted you to see. This one is judicial type. It's a judicial type of peace that has solved my quarrel with God. So I and God are no longer quarreling. Do you know how big this blessing is? It is because I and God are no longer quarreling. It is because I am declared righteous. It is because my challenge with God has been solved. Now I can come into God's presence and discuss with him because we are no longer quarreling. It is this justification that makes it possible for me to pray. Are you there? And all of these things are, are available to me through priesthood, the priesthood of Jesus. Oh, you are not following. I need to show you the priesthood of Jesus first before I begin to show you your own priesthood because your own priesthood is built on the foundation of his priesthood. See, his priesthood now has provided us justification. And because of justification, I can now go before God and stand before him to talk with him without condemnation, without inferiority, because I have been declared righteous. Do you understand that? Now, as we go into our own priesthood, you are going to see what we are going to do with this justification. Justification is going to be the reason for which we are going to gain a lot of mileage in the realm of the Spirit, because we are going to exploit the privilege that we have to be able to stand before God and to... So justification provides access. Please help me tell your neighbor. Justification provides access. Now, because of that word access, I need to show you a scripture. This one is not in the script. I'm just excited. So, um, let me show you a scripture. Are you there with me? Show you the scripture. Uh, the scripture I want to show you is the book of Second Corinthians chapter three, verse seventeen. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse seventeen. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I know you've read the scripture many times. But um, the use of the word liberty is consistent with ancient English. And English has since evolved. So once and again, we are enjoined to travel into the linguistic foundation in order for us to get a more robust um, rendering of that verse. That liberty there is actually access. Now, the reason why it begins with now, it means now there means in the resurrection. How many of you have ever done anything like agri, sorry, plant production? You planted something, 
and the thing grew, and you ate from what you planted. Okay, so we have a few people here. So how many of you have never planted anything? Everything you have been eating is what other people plant. Okay. Try planting something. Huh? So when you take corn in your hands and you cast it into the ground, the corn might be white, the corn might be yellow, but when it comes into the ground and it stays in the ground, it absorbs the moisture of the earth and, and soil mineral um, matter and soil water. Uh, what it does is that it affects the, the outer shell of the seed and then it releases the, the, the vital force. And so you will see germination will take place. When a plant germinates from the ground, you will notice that it is not the same as the seed that was casted into the ground. The corn was yellow, but when it grew, it was green. It didn't look like what you cast it down. The same thing that happened to Jesus. Jesus was buried, but in resurrection, he now manifests as the life-giving spirit. So the noun there means in resurrection. The Lord Jesus that you used to know is now that spirit. Exactly. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is access. So part of this access is made possible because of our justification. Now we can stand before God. There's no quarrel between me and God anymore. And this new blessing that we have available to us is on the basis of our justification. So the peace that is spoken about in this context is a judicial kind of peace that has settled the discord I had with God. So now I can access God. Now I can do business with God. Now I can pray. Now I can come into God's presence. Now I can stand and knock. I can stand and ask. I can stand and seek. And I have the opportunity to exploit the potential and the power of prayer just because an altar was set up that guaranteed my justification. So that's the first kind of peace. I want to show you the second kind of peace. The second kind of peace is in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. This second kind of peace is critical to your priesthood. It's very critical to your engagement of God. This second kind of peace is experiential. Are you there in Ephesians chapter 2 beginning from verse 11? Ephesians chapter 2 beginning from verse 11. He said, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcised by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. Can you see? Blood. Anytime you see atonement, are you there? Anytime you see the blood, just think altar. Because altar is synonymous with sacrifice. Anytime you see blood. So when you go back to your Bible this evening, take your electronic Bible and run a search. All the times you, you see blood in the New Testament, every such time, what is drawing your attention to is an altar. I'm going to show you the characteristics of altars various definitions of altars, and one of them is that it's a place of atonement. So anytime you see the blood, it is referring to an altar. In fact, the way God designed human life is that human life will be supported, reinforced, and powered by altars. And just in case you have no altar, you are naked. I remember when Rabiu, how many of you know Rabiu? Okay, when Rabiu gave his life to Christ, and uh, hallelujah. I did not take permission from Rabbi to say this, so I, I will not say it. So let me say the one that I wanted to say initially. When he gave his life to Christ, his mother called him because he was from a staunch Muslim family. 
and he was being raised to become an imam. Rabi was exceptionally intelligent, so they had noticed his intelligence, and they felt that the best use that his intelligence could be put to was to make him an imam. And it was still the intelligence that gave him the <laughs> that inquisitive mind that uh, did not allow him to settle on the family vision. <laughs> Hallelujah. So he gave his life to Christ. And then when he gave his life to Christ, ah, well, his surname is Madaki. Madaki. That's not a name, it's a title. That's his grandfather's title. Because the grandfather was the chieftain of altars in the territory. In fact, oh my God. So, so altars, charms, and all of that were part of their civilization. So when he gave his life to Christ, he wanted to have nothing to do with charms and all that stuff. So his mother called him one day and said, you'll be moving around with an empty stomach. <laughs> that nobody lives life as a man with an empty stomach. What she meant by that idiomatic expression is that you need charms to arm yourself, that life is supernatural. And the only way to administer life is to have supernatural support and reinforcement. She was wrong. She was wrong because Rabbi was not without spiritual support. We have taught him the way of altars. And when all the beasts of his family came against him, it was proven that the altars that he surfaced were stronger than the altars of the Madaki family. As you, say, as you see here. Now, the way God designed it is that the life of a man will be reinforced, will be supported, will be powered by altars. Life is spiritual. And what the mom said to him was suggestive of the fact that you cannot fulfill natural life without spiritual support. Some of our ancestors discovered the same thing. They found out that man was frail, man was insufficient, man was incapable, man was limited. So they needed something to give this frail, easily vaporized human life some form of certainty. And that's why they made covenant with Aleku and with Swem. And the other day I was telling somebody that Aleku has no power. And then the person, you know, Tupo, the person say, when you say short, such things, you whisper it. Don't, <laughs> don't say it loud. What, what are you saying? You say, what? In this land, they don't make such statements. We can't repeat it after you because we are idoma. Ah. He's a victim. 16 years later, I saw him in Abuja. He was still a victim. We can change our fortunes this month so that the outcome of our interactions with the realm of the spirit will produce fruit that our family members will know that we have gone beyond the limits that have been placed by the family altars in the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Verse 14 is my emphasis. For he is our peace. This is organic peace. The first one is judicial peace. This one I'm speaking about here is organic peace. Please, just label it and keep it. Because when we start the practicalities of altars, you are going to be able to measure your level of compliance with spiritual demands based on this organic peace. So don't forget the Bible says that the chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. There was a payment that was made in order for us to have both judicial peace and organic peace. When I say organic peace, I'm talking about peace that is a function of the life of God that is operational in your spirit. If you are in alignment with God, that peace will be boosted. If you are in dislocation with God, that peace, the, you will feel an infraction in that peace. And if for any reason you feel an infraction in that peace, it means you are not safe. That's one of the reasons that points that you are in a state of emergency. And when you are in a state of emergency, you will break your routine to attend to the emergency at hand. Is that not so? Okay. So we are going to, as we study on priesthood, we are going to highlight 
circumstances that suggest that you are in a state of emergency. But we have not reached there. We have not reached there. We're still trying to do uh, the broad strokes before we go to the specific strokes. And the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. So this is, this, you know, I told you that the Old Testament points to the New Testament. It is a shadow of good things to come. It's a shadow of better things. So the Old Testament is prophetic. And if you have the eyes, blessed eyes, you can actually see the New Testament hidden in the Old Testament because the Old Testament is prophetic in itself. You still call it Old Testament if you don't have the eyes to see the New Testament in it. If you have the eyes to see the New Testament in it, it is just one. It's just that the Old Testament is prophetic and it is pointing to good things to come. But if you have the eyes, it is one. Are you there? I say, are you there? You know, the, uh, some guys came up with a theological position and they said, you know, the New Testament began when the blood of Jesus Christ was shed. So it means Jesus was not a New Testament preacher. Jesus was actually an Old Testament preacher. So we should not, we should not uh, rely on the words of Jesus because it is within the scope of a regime that is not as recent as what we have in the uh, New Testament. That, I, I, if there were, was a police among preachers, such, such people should be, should be arrested and quarantined. You know, there's a kind of injection they give cows. Have you? <laughs> the Lord will help us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do you realize that Jesus forgave people's sins before the cross? Or you don't know that? You think the Bible is a mathematical book? It has its own logic. And except the Holy Spirit opens your eyes, you'll come out a heretic. That's why there were, there were, there were places where they burned people those days. When you start going the way of error, it means there's a spirit whispering to you. We know something is talking to you. And if we can prove from the Bible that it's not the Holy Ghost, they, they put you there and just, this. They touch it. That your kind should not dwell in the Christian community. Error was like a plague that could bend the minds of men and they dealt with it decisively. Today we play with falsehood. We advertise it. We drink it. We celebrate it. And we defend it. Guess what? It's too late. Because the Puritans are coming. The Puritans will not keep quiet. There's a movement that has begun to recover Christianity from charlatans. I'm moved to talk, but no, I'm moved. I'm moved. <laughs> hey! The God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jesus. It was by these same words that they were admonished. They became pillars in the earth that God could put his foot upon to establish his purposes in the earth. God cut covenant with humankind as, as unreliable as we are. It was the word of God that was upon their heart. It became their creed. They lived it out. So by the time you go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews says that it is by this same faith that the elders obtained a good report. The presbyteros obtained a good maturerio. The word maturerio, that's where ma mataya comes from. It means that the work of God upon their heart was so deep. Their convictions were so deep. The only way you can take them away from their con con convictions was that you kill them. As long as they live. This is who they are. And you could not separate them from their convictions. They came before kings and said, we are not afraid to respond to you in this matter. We and our faith are one. It takes a radical to be a revivalist. When people are used to compromise, then he releases the spirit of Elijah. The spirit that is not compatible with compromise, not compatible with any departure from the line of truth. Oh my God, he stands his ground even though he's one man. He brought a nation back to her knees. God has no restraint either to win with many or to conquer with few. We will not deny Jesus. We will not see black and call it white. Even if we will gain financially from it. Our mouth is not bought. We came to be a testimony of his resurrection. 
Sorry, I just troubled you with my own personal. <laughs> it was my calling that was speaking. It was that thing speaking. It's my calling. It confronts compromise with, 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 with passion. The passion. Oh, some people thought that, okay, if they're treating us with death, you are, you, are, you are mistaken. There is a depth of intercourse you can have with Jesus that you, don't, you are not afraid of death. If, it, if the bullet should bring me down, it means that God counted me worthy to pay the ultimate sacrifice. And men more vicious, men more strong, men more vocal than myself will rise from that seed. Oh, I have seen the glory of God. Sorry, I can no longer do this Bible study. I have seen the glory of God. I have seen the glory of Jesus. There's nothing as bright as it. There's nothing as powerful as it. There's nothing in this world to be compared to it. I will live gazing on that glory and I will die to possess it. <laughs>